Why hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zinger show with me your host Agassino Zinger and this is episode number 396 that's 396 of the Agassino Zinger show how you doing how you feeling great amazing good to know how am I you know same old same old hanging in there as per usual for dear life waiting for furlough not waiting for furlough holding my breath not holding my breath closing my eyes not closing my eyes and walking through doors backwards if it's your first time checking out the show via youtube make sure you smash that like hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast site please give me a five star review download the show and share it with your friends what are you waiting for? Share it with your compadres, share it with your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, your dog, your auntie, that guy you never spoke to anymore from school, but you always keep bumping into him on the way to work and every else, everyone else under the moon, share it, spread it, do all that good stuff. Don't spread your butt cheeks, but spread the show. You're not spreading your butt cheeks, you should always reserve for somebody that you're in love with. Um, you know, in love with me, unless you are, then you're more than welcome to spread them, but don't send me pictures because there's COVID and I don't want to get ill. But regardless, good to see you again. We're back in the hot seat. So what's changed? Not much in it. When I when I when I um when I record the show and I'm like, what's changed? Or that's why it's not really fun to even date things anymore. Back in the day, let's say a couple of years ago, or when I started this, which was what, 2017? It was quite fun to date stuff, right? You'd date the show, you'd say what time it was, so you could go back and think, yeah, man, it's a time capture of my life. Now when I look back at myself speaking on this podcast, I look so much, I look like I'm so full of life. I've lived so many, I've gone through so many different experiences. I'm talking about the trips I've gone to, um, places, yeah, places I've visited, friends I've seen, palavas I've got up to on the weekend, and now it's just what reporting stuff you see on the internet like god damn it how bo like this really goes to show you know when people are like oh we're gonna be living in a digital world right digital avatars that's how we're gonna be living we're not gonna be real human beings just like mm, we, we we probably still need to be real human beings we need to be living an actual real existence for us to for it to inform our digital avatar right it has to be that way you know Instagram isn't fun if you're not going places, right? If you're not buying things and going places, Instagram is boring. There's only so many throwback Thursday, Tuesday pitch, pictures you can start uploading. Like, I only found out about throwback Thursday through this fucking lockdown. I didn't even know they existed. But, you know, for it, because I've got such a dearth in content to provide for, for my uh, uh, ravenous audience, I'm having to kind of, you know, um, spread this stuff out between the, the days of Tuesdays and Thursdays. Sometimes I'll stay up until, you know, half past 12 on a Wednesday night so I can technically post my first throwback Thursday before everybody else. Like, how sad is my existence? But yeah, man, this whole digital life is not the vibe. So um, the podcasters haven't really been hitting as much as they should be because I'm not living life, but I hope that um, they've been providing some level of distraction and relief to this crazy times that we're living in at the moment, which is such an overused phrase. I know it's disgusting, yuck. I'm vomiting in my own mouth saying it. It's like a new normal. It's like enough with this new normal, enough, we get it. Um, but, you know, I don't have any other way to describe it. We are living in unprecedented times, right? That's what people always do, that fucking stupid politician hand. But, yeah, man, at least, you know, at least we'll have something to um, look back upon, innit? You know, because I think there is a, there has to be a, I wouldn't say there has to be, but I would assume there is a, a big enough portion of the population, especially in Western Europe, who have pretty much gone through life unscathed, right? The type who have got, you know, grew up in a two-parent household, or if if not, you know, your your parents sort of co-parented you pretty well. You didn't really see them argue too tough. Uh, pretty strong extended family network. Pretty strong network of friends good job um you know all the kind of you know things that you'd think okay this makes for a good life and you've not really had any hurdles you have not had any issues i'm pretty sure there's a good majority of people out there that exist like that this might be the only thing right they've kind of gone through legitimately in life that's kind of you know made them pause or made them reflect or just front up an obstacle so maybe that's beneficial for them isn't it like having that having that kind of um obstacle in your life can be somewhat beneficial i'd assume because I'm thinking about the people that have like, you know, they went through, it's like my analogy would be like going through the person that you meet in school that's like, you know, just aced everything from primary to secondary to college to uni. As soon as they left uni, they got a great, you know, entry level job. Those type of people are, 
they're a bit weird when you do meet them because you know they're just so perfect and so well put together that it sort of throws you off because you're used to hanging around with so many delinquents but then once you get to know them you're like wow these people actually it's like when you meet a really you know, you know when you're a kid and you're in a group of friends and you and you, know, you realize that one of your friends is really rich but he doesn't really act like it right and he's just really normal and he goes out of his way to kind of you know make sure he's one of the boys because he doesn't want anyone to kind of treat him any different and you're like wow these pe people like that can exist you can be extremely wealthy very privileged and also just be sound it's just you know the kind of the dicks and the narcissists and the sociopaths they're the ones that sort of get pr prompted up and shoved in front of our faces but those people that you know are able to just pass through life you know basically unscathed this must be an eye-opening and if not kind of um pivotable moment in your life because i think most of us who have kind of I'd, I'd classed as normal the ones i've had a few setbacks in life this is you know it's painful it's annoying but it's no different to you know losing your flipping wallet during a festival abroad somewhere for the first time losing a job not getting the job losing a parent breaking up with somebody i mean we've gone through so many of those things so this is like extended and prolonged and something about outside of our control but for the most part you have the emotional tool set to be able to deal with it so it can be a bit easier to deal with i'm just talking out loud i don't know if this is true but imagine if you've gone through your life completely unscathed and then suddenly you get hit with this like, <gasps> do you know what i mean like, bloody hell what am i meant to do now but i don't know who knows maybe it's for the good maybe it's for the better we don't know we only know like the, when people say it's only going to be for the better, only if you survive in it, really. It's kind of a point of privilege to even say, oh, it's going to be for the good. We're all going to come. It's like whenever, you remember the beginning of um, lockdown and everyone was like, oh, look at the, look at the, what you call it? The lakes in like um Florence, they're all clear now and all the fishes are swimming and everyone's party. All the, yeah, all the animals are singing and dancing all over the place. That was nice to say at that point in time, because, you know, you were thinking you're going to get back to your regular scheduled programming of life in September. Now September's been and gone and it's looking like we're going to be heading into like March, most probably, most likely. I always said from the beginning that it was probably going to be about 18 months. So it's sort of like looking, you know, like 18 months is probably going to be on point in terms of like getting back to normal, normal, like, you know, doing what you did in 2019. Uh, but now no one's saying that sort of stuff about the animals and no one gives a flying fuck. Everyone just wants to get back to living, you know what I mean? Um, probably some you know anti-hunting brigade people are probably happy that the animals are being spared but yeah what a weird one so it's hard to have anything to be informed by but there you know the world being what it is there's so many nutty things happening at the moment you know you've got the u.s election still you know undecided i have no idea how they put that together it's so confusing trying to follow that and understand why the person that just doesn't get the most votes wins electoral college um states not being like I heard, you know, do you remember in the beginning of the election or before the election actually happened, Trump was complaining about, you know, mail-in ballots, right? And I didn't really read through it. I'm not sure if he was complaining because he was afraid that most of the people that mail in are Democrats or because he was afraid of the, that being rigged, right? Because I guess if you go to vote in person like anywhere else in the world, especially in a Democrat society, you just turn up, show your ID or, you know, whatever you registered with and then you're able to sign in the signing pool. And it's a bit more easier to kind of regulate um, of course, there is still aspects of fraud there, I'm sure, but, you know, it's probably a lot harder to fraud a actual polling station, physical one, than it is to mail in. So maybe that's why he was complaining. But regardless, he was complaining from, you know, ages ago, like let's say six or eight months ago. And if these guys in the media, especially the media, or especially if in the Democratic Party because they wanted to win, if they hate this guy so much, they shouldn't have given him any excuse to complain and they should have just made sure that the ballots things or the mail-in ballots was just dealt with in it in the beginning or on the on the other side of things maybe the republicans should have went out of their way to make sure that mail-in ballots couldn't be fucked with or just put as much attention as they, to be honest they did try didn't they yeah they did they were complaining a lot to be fair about the mail-in ballots from ages ago and it seems like they have a reason to complain because it does look dodgy even though you know the ex the explanation you're getting now at the moment is like oh actually biden was um, even though he was behind in the states that he's now ahead in, those states were, uh, what you call it, primarily going to vote for Biden because the majority of people who voted voted mail-in and for some reason only Democrats know how to use envelopes. I don't know how true that is, but this is what I've read on the internet.
I think that sounds fishy. I sound that I think that sounds dodgy as fuck. Especially, you know why it wouldn't sound dodgy? If it didn't, it wouldn't sound dodgy off the back of the whole like um, Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son story, right? The, if you're not familiar with it, the New York Post um, basically published a story supposedly alleging that Hunter Biden dropped off this laptop in a uh, repair shop somewhere. He didn't go to pick it up, so the owner hacked into it in order to kind of find out whose laptop it was, so he can you know do whatever. And in the process of that, he finds all these incriminating images and emails of hunter biden doing uns you know some very uh questionable things with some ladies of the night or you know alleged ladies of the night who knows it could be his friends and you know partaking in some substances that you would uh <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily want this to be filmed on camera doing or taking a picture with that story obviously gets put out in new york post a couple of weeks before the election it's a big story and for some reason Twitter censors it, right? And Twitter seems to be the main place where news disseminates. So I guess that's why it's a big deal. Um, they they block it from being shared because they say it's, it's got misinformation or it's fake news or the story can't be corroborated, whatever nonsense. And it's completely blocked. Like every time you try to upload the image, the, the, the link via Twitter, it kind of com completely blocks it. So Twitter have obviously got like some sort of back end resource that they can use that can just block stories from being shared on the timeline. Um, of course, Strazine effect, the more you block it, people are interested. So that built up a whole set of steam somewhere within that timeline. Twitter then suspends the New York Post for publishing that story you know versus what one of the oldest papers in the in america it's a bit salacious it's a bit tabloidy it's a bit daily mailish but still suspending their account because they decided to do what journalists should do and publish a story that pertain you know pertains to the election somewhat is it irresponsible maybe but let's say if this was donald trump jr and he was caught in a hotel room somewhere or motel room actually not even a hotel it looked like a motel motor rural getting up to all sorts of nonsense right they wouldn't have it they would be so pissed off so for them to turn around and suddenly say no 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 you can't see this that's what makes this whole like voting thing mail-in ballots seem very fishy again i don't know nothing i'm so 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 um my knowledge base in terms of politics especially even in the uk is flipping you know it's not where it should be really considering that i'm a you know a a citizen of the uk and i kind of uh pride myself on trying to be as informed as i can one of my blind spots is politics i don't know much what about i'm talking about i'm just regurgitating what i read online but from what i can pass and from what i can kind of delineate and kind of read between the lines it does seem more fishy it does seem more, more fishy in in light of that incident that suddenly now you know hunter i'm sorry joe Biden was behind and then suddenly now he's ahead because of these mysterious mail out mail ballots are coming but the only thing i don't understand is why the republicans want the count to be stopped like if there are these secret stashes of mail-in ballots it probably is for their best interest to demand they all get counted and then for them to say hey we don't mind them all getting counted but it's impossible like imagine if they say oh there's these secret bags of, tr of votes that haven't been counted yet let's like, say three black bin bags full right it'll be within the republicans interest to say you know what we don't mind you counting these bags but if all three bags are blue then this is obviously a fix right because if there are some leftover ballots why are they all democratic vote why are they all votes for joe biden there should be some votes in there for trump just to kind of you know uh, make the fix look not so rigged or let me yeah, you, you do that right you'd kind of make it not, not look that dodgy but if they're all a clean sweep for him and, you know, they kind of bring upon the blue wave, then it does seem fishy. The only issue is all this complaining, all this whining ain't going to do nothing, in it? They ain't going to change that result. You know, Trump is, and that's the problem as well, I think, governing the way Trump has. You know, I think he's done stuff. I think he's done good stuff, right, in terms of policies and stuff for a certain segment of the population are pretty happy with the stuff that he's enacted whether it's tax breaks or whatever again i'm not too familiar with politics but i'm assuming he has done some good stuff but i just think personally as a guy and this is the issue at hand in general which i mentioned previously in other shows about other individuals about cancel culture cancel culture really in my opinion really affects people especially when they're not liked like when you're not liked anyway by a majority by a small minority of vocal minority of people they will look for any reason to cancel you because they don't like you. So as soon as you make one mistake, they're just going to pounce on it, right? And it's literally impossible to come back. If you're liked, like Joey Diaz was liked, um, like that guy, I keep forgetting his name of who came back. Bloody hell, I forgot his name. It doesn't matter, right? But there's a few people, right, who are liked enough that they can kind of bounce back from the public cancellation. 
But because Trump is so derided, like even by people that actually voted for him, they sort of just put up with him because, you know, he's sort of like, um, he just upsets people, isn't it? So I guess some people kind of get some uh, value and some, you know, some, hu some humorous value out of seeing people who are politically opposed to their ideals getting all riled up online and crying and getting into hysterics and fits and shit. But he's such a unlikable guy, isn't it? <laughs> he's such a dick, right? That people are not going to give him any kind of leeway in this sort of like fight for you know for in his sort of like legal fight against these cow speed and against these um mail-in ballots being counted you know incorrectly or you know disproportionately favoring joe biden no one's ever ever gonna be like you know what we're gonna let's be on his side let's hear what he has to say never because he's been you know a pretty divisive president if that maybe it's not his fault too i don't know because he when he came into it like they, he was never given like as the, the dave Chappelle comedy sketch in it he was never really given a chance in it to even be anyway somewhat you know uh, can, could he, i don't think he could could he he was never really given the chance to be that you know to be a, america's president but then again could i really picture donald trump reaching across the aisle as they say in america and sort of like you know bringing people to the table and you know having doing some compromises agreeing to disagreeing i don't think he could do it man. i just don't think so especially if you believe what you read about you know him not really wanting to run and sort of like running only off the back of that um presidential roast thing that will happen when he was like sat in the middle of a crowd and you know, Obama was just roasting him on the stage, telling him how he could never be president, just mocking him. And I think since then, he just had a beanie's bonnet about, you know, proving everybody wrong. And he did, basically. You know, he kind of was able to put a big middle finger up at the establishment, especially the media, the the media, right? Yeah, the, the left-leaning media who sort of always kind of took the piss out of him um, and the people that liked him as well. So he was... That's the thing, as well, the odd thing about Trump, because he's so simple in the way he talks and stuff that somehow he's been he's become like the martyr not the martyr he's become like the symbol and the sort of like leader for middle america in it the people who think that they're not being fairly represented in hollywood and media in general right you know every time you see an a you know somebody with a country accent on american television they always cast them as like the dummy in it as like the you know the yeah it's just a bit slow you know they only provide like comedic value just from the way they say words they're never like the you know they're never like the what's the thing called the lead detective in some really detailed police drama thing in it they're always like the you know the muscle or the you know the crafty crook on the side they get treated pretty poorly in it pretty as poorly as blacks and and latinos do in in america man it's pretty pretty rough but it's odd as well, again, you know, the, the, the media kind of built him up to be one thing and overall it hasn't necessarily built, meant he's, he hasn't really turned into that guy. It doesn't feel like it, but regardless, anyway, it looks like Joe Biden might, it's going to probably win. He's up to about, last time I checked, it was about 253 electoral votes, I think, and Trump was on like 218. You need 270 to win. You know, it's pretty impossible for Trump to kind of make up that space in, in this race. So Joe Biden will be the next president of the United States, I'm assuming. And if that's true, because I, I, my guess at the beginning was that it was going to be Trump just because it's 2020 and there's just been too many 2020 things that have happened um, that I couldn't see it going any other way. It just had to be this way. And you know? from COVID to the deaths of celebrities and stuff, it's just been a wild, crazy year in it natural disasters it just seemed like a perfect way to end 2020 would be for trump to win a second term by a landslide i don't know why i felt that but it didn't happen that way i'm assuming the establishment just had enough of him and just wanted to get trump out of the white house and didn't matter if they you know put in place a pretty uh mentally compromised um you know old age pensioner in joe biden they're both old age pensioners don't get me wrong but you know they didn't they didn't care it's like imagine the democrats are so desperate to get trump out of the white house they hated him so much that they were willing to you know uh they were willing to sort of fix the democratic election so that bernie sanders didn't win right so they could push their guy forward in what you call it what's his face in joe biden and i guess at the time it was kamala harris and it was like, God almighty, man. Pretty weird, isn't it? Pretty weird. But hey, maybe it's for the best that, that he that he does lose. 
I think if you have, if Trump would have won, it would have been just absolutely World War Three in America. Mm-hmm. Isn't it? It's already bad as it is now. Imagine if he would have won. Like the left would have just been insane. He's got the left to deal with, Antifa to deal. With. Whereas I think if if it was if it's the other way around, Joe Biden, you only have to deal with the you know the essentially the conservatives. Sorry, the Republicans. You don't have to deal with anybody else, and maybe some maybe some proud boys. That's about it. Um, for the most part, isn't it? I'd assume you don't really have to deal with anybody else, but. <sighs> It's still going to be a sticky, a sticky year for everybody I think involved. So, again, if you're in the states and you are still waiting for your president to be elected, you know, thoughts and feelings go out to you guys. And um, hopefully, either way, regardless of what way it ends up, hopefully your country is able to sort of heal itself and mend a little bit, and the divisions are hopefully can be mended somewhat because it's sad to see from the outside looking in, right? To see a country so divided. And when you think of America, you think of like star spangled banner kids in classrooms singing the national anthem now that looks like now that image of kids singing in the national anthem in the school classroom looks like something out of the third reich in it right which is it's bizarre because most of those early 90s teen boppy movies were like always featured that bit in it that kind of bit where kids were singing the national anthem in schools so, you know what that big of a deal there'd be a, a, an american flag in the classroom and shit now i guess some kids would be campaigning for that stuff to get pulled down it's a really sad state of affairs but hey hopefully things change you can only hope for the best going forward again maybe this is a good sign that 2020 is going to end with a somewhat um good bang and not about kind of not a loud kind of bang we can only hope we can only hope so um what else i wanted to talk about and feature on here before we move on? oh yeah so as basically i think as a consequence of covid and there's been some really interesting job losses at the moment in it? and one interesting one that i just saw featured here via espn says as follows let me get up here on the screen so it says espn to cut 500 jobs as covid19 erodes revenues now obviously we understand you know what covid19 has done to certain business sectors and it makes complete sense that some places would be facing some pressures and strains to their workforce revenue um making abilities and whatever it may be but sometimes i think about some of these closures or some of these redundancies and it makes me i'm a little bit dubious because i know how unscrupulous business people can be right because i'm sure some people just like you and i you know we use remember at the beginning we use covid as an excuse not to meet our friends because we didn't want to go outside or you know um whatever yeah you'd use these kind of things to your, your you know to your advantage now of course as time goes on it's sort of a bit more difficult to get out of those social engagements in social engagement sorry so there's a part of me that thinks i wonder if businesses are using the guise of covid as an excuse just to trim the workforce so that they can up their overall revenue and up their overall profits because I, most companies especially companies of the size of espn their major outgoings are payroll right payroll whether it's contractor staff or freelancers it accounts for a you know a big chunk of what a company actually has to raise or especially spending year on year so what perfect way to essentially get out of paying people by what by you know making some wide sweeping changes and redundancies across the entire company sparing nobody and just affecting everybody from you know the person at the front or the reception to somebody that's basically the head of a, a particular division covid would be a good guy because i don't understand why espn you know with all the major sports still on now in the us i think right nfl still under the bubble basketball's on with the bubble season just finished uh baseball's on with the bubble nascar's on with the bubble at the beginning of the year well a bit of the year, i remember that because there was a whole um, controversy about the supposed uh flag or whatever that was happening there so yeah, most of the sports are on at the moment, isn't it? Your MLS, I think, is on. I'm not too sure about MLS. So it doesn't. It, it, it's that, and of course, um, USC MMA has been one of the sports that's kind of been running throughout the entire year. So it doesn't really make sense why this would be an issue. But anyway, let's read what they said in LA Times. It says the following. Ba, 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 ba. It says ESPN is slashing 500 jobs as costs and pressures for the COVID-19 pandemic are accelerating the sports media company moving into uh, moving to streaming. Um, the cuts, which include 300 layoffs, were revealed on Thursday in a memo from Jimmy Piatro, president of the Walt Disney co-owned unit. Um, in addition to the layoffs around 
Another 200 open positions will be eliminated, the company said. ESPN is more than 500, 5,000 employees worldwide. Okay, so it's not as much as I thought it was. So it's, it's 200 positions that are open that they were basically hiring for and 300 already at the company, which makes it 500. They were hiring 200 people. Jesus Christos. That's probably a good thing about some of these layoffs, I guess, for the company side of things. There's probably way too many cooks for the in the kitchen there, isn't it? The amount of people they have to, to, you know, working on one show, one set, um, one division, especially if you think of it, you know, they've got what, I guess every major sport in the US has a college sort of division thing in it, which they're probably covering to some extent. It's regional. They're probably covering to a certain extent. It's absolutely insane. Um, but again, there's sports on TV. Why would they want to make cuts? If ever there was a time where you could be exploiting the fact that everyone's at home with nothing to do, it'll be during the pandemic, right? Anyway, it says here's a quote. Prior to the pandemic, we had been deeply engaged in strategizing how best to position ESPN for future success amidst tremendous distribution in how fans consume sports. Pietro said in a memo viewed by the Times, the pandemic's significant impact on our business clearly accelerated those forward-looking discussions. Hmm okay the company based in bristol connecticut did not specify which areas will be affected but people familiar with the plans who were not authorized to discuss the matter publicly said the cuts would be across different departments i guess that's a small comfort you could have if you're losing your job in it it's not just because that's the worst thing because i've been part of a redundancy before when it's you know the entire company is basically going under because your fan has been unable to secure funding or just you know the, the nature of the business has just changed or the industry or the actual industry that you're in has collapsed whatever it may be and it does hurt a bit when you're like you when it's sort of like you know you're only getting let go because you're one of the expendables right you're kind of what entry level mid-level executive they're usually the ones to quick to quick to go so they can consolidate your role into somebody up above but when it's affecting your manager too it does kind of you know help to soften the blow somewhat it's a bit sad to say but it is what it is um continue ESPN lost a massive amount of programming this year as a shutdown related to the coronavirus uh, trunk, uh, trunk, truncated yeah? truncated this lineup of NBA, Major League Baseball and other sports, but they're back on now. NBA players were moved into the fall, of course, putting them into competition with other events which kind to their ratings. Mm, that's an easy excuse. I don't believe that. Either... Either this is a get what go broke thing, because I know, you know, ESPN have, you know, sort of like pivoted in some of their messaging. And of course, with the stuff that's happened uh, post George Floyd, there's obviously been a, a reckoning in terms of, you know, how they represent certain voices on TV and blah, blah, blah. So I'm assuming that must have had some impact. Maybe it, maybe it's just a purely sporting thing, but that surely have had to have impact. I don't really sure this whole idea behind, oh, there's just too much on TV at the moment. It's eating into our figures. I don't think that's completely right. So again, if I were to ESPN, I'd be a little bit peeved off, you know, like it, you'd think the one place where you'd be sort of guaranteed to have a job would be at a place that basically doubles up for a satellite TV company, right? Imagine, yeah, imagine like a cable company cutting people because they can't, what, get shows to people's homes quick enough or something. Oh, it doesn't make any sense. Um Pietro's uh, memo noted that the company had already taken cost cutting steps such as executive and talent salary reductions, furloughs, and budget cuts. Jesus Christos. At the same time, the lockdowns have been occurred. Um, the country's dealings with the rising COVID 19 infections has driven more consumers to streaming services, speeding up the transition away from traditional television. Okay, fair enough, I guess. But aren't there, ever, there must be a, a big majority of people, like here in the UK, we have Sky Sports. But there's still a lot of people that use like Sky Go, right? Or people that use that BT Sport. Um, the people that have BT Sport on their sort of like box, but also use the app online. You know, if you don't have a, a TV or whatever, maybe I'm sure that exists for ESPN too. So I don't. Again, I'm not too. I'm not really buying all this. Um, it says the ESPN successfully launched a streaming product. Its service ESPN Plus has 8.5 million subscribers, much more than Quibi, <laughs> but still gets the bulk of its revenue from fees paid by cable and salary operations that carry its channel. Of course, so it's bread and butter is cable, and then the streaming service is additional. And then they're trying to say what cable shows have sort of dipped. I don't know. Cord cutting and the shift by younger consumers away from TV subscriptions continue to erode the revenue source. Households with pay TV, most of which carry ESPN, has been under steady decline from the peak in 2010. Yeah, I guess again, like I said, I think it's a convert. I'm going to leave it there. You can read the whole article yourself. I'll That's what it's called. ESPN to cut 500 jobs as COVID-19 erodes revenues. There's a part of me that thinks it's a convenient and an easy excuse to sort of try out, right? Um, but if you think about it, 
this kind of reminds me a lot of like when I found out that DVD sales, I think in the US still amount to like a million per year or something in sales in actual physical DVDs that people are purchasing. So there's still a demand for it. There's still a population of people who still use you know, conventional DVD players to watch movies, have collections in their homes, boxes of stuff and shelves full of DVDs that they watch again and again and again. That's why some, that's why directors make directors cuts and had additions to people to watch. Yeah, you can watch them via a streaming platform, but most of those things sort of like um, came to a head when you got your DVD case. I remember you buy movies and you had like two CDs in, right? With some of the bloopers on the other one. So that kind of goes against conventional wisdom that everybody's online streaming stuff. I don't think that's necessarily true most people are still at home watching stuff on tv so why would you need to let people go but again what do i know moving on what else do we have here yes move this one yeah so um this is a uh, distressing news as per usual for me and when it comes to flipping manchester united but Unfortunately, Manchester United somehow managed to lose 2-1 against Istanbul the other night in the Champions League. I guess it's not that much of a, it's not that much of a bad defeat for us, seeing as we basically won our first up two opening matches against two very strong opponents in PSG and Red Bull Leipzig. So there's sort of two points, two or well, six points we probably um, didn't think we would get. Maybe we thought we'd have got four points out of the six. So you can afford to maybe lose one against a weaker opponent and then bounce back against a better opponent. But of course, it gives you a mountain to climb up. And um, yeah, a lot of a lot of blowback. A lot of uh, the fallout from this has been pretty grave, especially um, considering how we played in the week against Arsenal, right? So lineup wise, you know, of course we lost two one as you can see on the screen. You're probably aware of that. But lineup wise, as per usual, this is where all the, always the alarm bells go for me when it comes to United. Um, again. He, I, w- I guess he kind of went for the diamond, didn't really go for the diamond. Instead, he played this weird system with the regular back five with the um, exception of Dean Henderson and Axel Twanzebi, but again, pretty easy replacements for the Gea and Lindelof, whoever it may be. And then w- two deep lining midfielders to basically protect the back four and add some you know, necessary you know, protection. And also as a base of our midfield were Matic and Van der Beek. Van der Beek, for the most part, from what I've seen of him, has never been a number six. He's always kind of strike, stroke, striked me as like a conventional number eight in terms of getting box to box or an out and out number 10 in terms of he occupies that space, right? Just again, it's hard to describe these players because most modern day players aren't, you know, your conventional number types, right? You don't really have... You, there's no more Stuart Downings, right? It's a bad example, but, you know, wingers are just like hug the touchline, kick it to the bottom and then whip it in. They don't really exist anymore. So wingers are sort of like inverted. They're sort of like uh, Serge Nabry types and Ferran Torres types, right? They're sort of like, you know, able to um, cover the width of the 18 of, of the yeah, of the penalty area. Regardless, I don't think Van der Beek is a deep lining midfielder in any way, shape or form, right? He can play as an eight, box to box, or a number 10, occupy that position behind the strikers. Somehow he's playing man to, you know, uh, hand-to-hand with Matic, which is always going to be a complete error. Um, that kind of set my alarm bells ringing. And then, of course, moving further forward, you had Rashford, Bruno Fernandes, and Juan Mata as a free, providing the support. And the ball's necessary for Martial for on his own. And it was, for me, it's a recipe for disaster. Like, as soon as I saw that formation, I was like, Jesus Christ. And for me, the, the, the issue here isn't the players and it's also the system and the shape. Um, you go through it one by one, with the exception of Martial. You go to Matt and you think to yourself, Matt's best position is within this number 10 or this sort of area right here where he's occupying, right? But he needs more structure and more width around him so that he can be impactful in that zone. When he's playing as a conventional right wing forward, he doesn't have the pace, nor the dynamism in order to hurt people. But what he does have is a brain. So get him in a position where he should be playing. So Mata should always be, I've maintained this, should always be a replacement for Bruno Fernandes, who seems to be Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's golden boy, right? That's the position they should be playing in. Van der Beek too. Van der Beek should only be considered to be played in the position of a Bruno Fernandes, yeah, these two should be competing for that same position, as maybe should Pogba, or maybe you should say Pogba's like a, you know, he plays maybe on the left of of the, of the back two. But if that's the case, in my opinion, because we've all kind of assumed 
that Pogba can't defend. And if he can't defend, he can only play in this number 10 position. So you then have to ask yourself, if you're Solskjaer, are you brave enough to drop Bruno Fernandes and rotate Mata, Van der Beek and Pogba in the same position? Because that's basically what's happening. Eventually, we'd have to let go of one of those players, but that essentially is the case. Then you've got Rashford playing on the left, who's meant to provide the width and the, you know, stretch the teams and, you know, be dynamic and attacking. But again, against a low block team such as um, Istanbul, who set up the way you see on the screen, then by up front, two banks of four with a person in the middle, right? Very, very compact um, and essentially just played on the counter and completely done us with two very quickly well taken goals, mostly due to our own defensive mistakes, but just exploiting some of the confusion in this middle of this park, which I think had a lot to say with the confusion in the first goal where we take a corner and somehow off the back of a corner, we get completely hooked. We get completely suckered into trying to cross the ball into the box. And then with the move breaks down, one of the sample player gets it pops it over the top it's not even that great of a ball he just kicks into space then about runs onto it and finishes it in the same style that he did against uh steven gerrard that famously denied them winning the trip winning the league no no one to be found harry Maguire, nowhere to be found 85 million pound uh, central defender absolutely um nowhere to be found Wan Bissaka don't know where he was Twan Zabi don't know where he was matic don't know where he was Shaw for some reason was in a box trying to head a ball it's just a complete shit show so that already told me that what was going to happen in the game and i guess moving on from that the backlash from this game has been pretty substantial um for the most part so a lot of people now are questioning whether or not soul shark should be in a job which you know is a standard question that needs to be asked for any top club but unfortunately with our fan base at the moment maybe because soul shark has got such a legendary cult-like status at united a lot of fans desperately myself included wanted him to be successful right i really 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 wanted his scores to be a success at the club I honestly did um no kid like skulls i mean so with soul shark's career at united was essentially the stuff of dreams right being able to you know maybe not being the the starter and the main attraction but always being relied upon to come on and score very important very important goals um crucial goals sometimes in the in the span of a cup competition and really just set the temper right whenever he came on he raised he raised the temper he was very forward thinking uh always on the front foot always attacking always pressing defenders and of course once he went in front of the goal like his finishing was just absolutely another level just just fantastic finishing left foot right foot header like incredible i remember there was a time where he played in the right midfield when david beckham left just to, maybe the season when david beckham had the argument with um soul shot with saf and they kind of go into the heated argument. I think that was after he, you know, threw the boot in the change room. And Solskjaer had to play a couple of matches on right wing. And he was great, right? Very intelligent football player. So a lot of people went to do right, wanted him to do well. But unfortunately, at this level of football, there is not, there is just the name of the game. If the team doesn't perform, the first person to go is always a coach. Even more so at United, where we don't have the ownership or the footballing structure to really accommodate managers when they're going through rough spells. We don't have that. Um, you know, we don't have that infrastructure in place. <coughs> so the only thing that they can do is go and hire another coach to maybe get the best out of the players that they have um, amassed. Because, you know, if you believe what you read on the papers, Solskjaer didn't get most of his number one targets, but no manager does. But a pretty hefty amount of them would have made a lot of changes to this overall team. Not tactically, but I think it does individual performances. But still, um, this is really no surprise. So to see some of the kickback against fans wanting Solskjaer to, to go or to resign or thinking he's not good enough for the job is a bit odd considering um, the amount of success we've had in the past. This should just be standard procedure for a team like us, isn't it? But what do I know? And then um, this news uh, was essentially published during, you know, some time after the game via the Manchester Evening News. You can read into that what you want because they, you know, they're a little bit of a dubious source. But this is coming from Samuel Luckhurst, who has a lot of connections at United and is pretty decent in terms of, you know, getting some early news and, you know, um, some early vibes as to what's kind of going on behind the scenes. And the headline says, Manchester United approached Major Pochettino about becoming manager. 
And it says the following here it said Manchester United have approached Mr. Pochettino with a view of him replacing Alex Solskjaer as an next club manager. The MEN understands United have made contact with Pochettino's representative amid the team's dismal form under Solskjaer. MEN reported last December Pochettino wants to take over as United manager and his stance on the role is not believed to have changed. And it makes sense when you consider that he was on. Uh, Monday Night Football the other day on Sky Sports which is always a telltale sign that something's in the water now that could have been booked a time ago which I don't think it was but if he has if he has his, if the if his representative are as smart as I think they are and he is astute as I think he is then I'm sure that that kind of appearance on TV was just a kind reminder to everybody out there especially clubs wise like hey I'm about I'm you know here's my perspective on football and of course whenever it's it's always a, it's a shame for managers under pressure because especially Sky Sports they have such a woeful panel of analysts and pundits and presenters on their show that whenever whenever anyone comes on especially a former coach doesn't matter if they've got you know if they're pretty terrible and mediocre football coach the fact that they're, they're just a football coach the fact that they're a football coach alone and they've committed their lives to essentially coaching players and analyzing games and formations all that sort of good stuff. There's such a high level above your regular TV pundit that when they come on and just say anything, it always sounds way more insightful. So they always look super impressive talking, right? I think of Mourinho when he was on Sky Sports and Monday Night Football, giving analysis, I think of Wenger. Um, there's been a few managers, of course, geniuses and, you know, again, legends in their own right. But whenever just a coach goes on there, there's always a clear difference in terms of how they speak. Um, even you see the stuff with Patrice Vieira and Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank, the debates they were having. Like You could see those are two ex-pros, but also two people who have kind of gone through the process of getting their badges. So there's a lot more nuance to their conversations, even though they were talking in their second language. So that was great. So with Pochettino coming on Sky Sports, if you're an Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, you should have been nervous from that moment on like for sure that was a sign that things weren't going to turn around for you and unfortunately for Solskjaer in my opinion he doesn't seem like he's the manager that can get the best out of players that he has for a long period of time for a stretch of time maintain some form know what his best team is what's his best formation blah 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 blah, blah. but there's also my feeling on it is that there's been so much conversation about signings too much in my opinion especially when you consider how lackluster our signings were under the previous managers and it never quite worked out. There should just be maybe a commitment to having a shop in a certain amount of a budget, right? Just you know, committing to only spending a certain amount each summer, where it's 200 mil, 500 mil to cover five positions. I don't care, but just shopping under a certain budget and then trying to build our way up that way instead of going out and trying to sign all the best galactico -y kind of players and kind of work from there because... What we know for sure, the main concern is that the Glazers will always be the well for the for the foreseeable future. The Glazers will be the owners of United. Edward will be the de facto sporting director. So there's always going to be mismanagement at that level. So the only thing we can sort of pray for in terms of allowing our club to flourish in the future is to have a manager that can work within those constraints. Right? That is what I would think. And continues here, it says, inside a say, the United hierarchy were privately backing Solskjaer prior to Wednesday's night's shambolic Champions League defeat by Istanbul. Uh, what, how, how do you say that? Istanbul, Basak, Bas, Basak, Basak Shir, Basak Shir, Istanbul, Basak Shir. And are reluctant to part company with the Norwegian so early in the season. But if United lose at Everton on Saturday, they could end the weekend 17th in the Premier League title, or in the Premier League table. 17th. Now, in... Should, play, should managers be given time? Yeah, of course. In an ideal situation, managers should get all the time in the world to turn things around. But unfortunately, football clubs are, more, you know, the stuff that happens on a football pitch has reverberating effects throughout the entire organization of a team. Essentially, football teams are essentially like franchises in the United States, right? There has a lot more, it ties into the local commute, the local economy, um, you know, brand sponsorships abroad. There's so much at stake, so they cannot, simply cannot afford especially with all these sponsorship deals, uh, you know, still in the air, right? Um, renewals still kind of pending upon some certain uh, benchmarks being reached. Um, there's this assumption within outside of United, especially with some people that are in the know that the people behind the scenes at United are obsessed with social media um, engagement and outreach, right? They use this... Um, you know, our total number of followers to justify some bullshit decisions about what they do. 
they announce crappy sponsorships like they're so deluded they're so detached from what the actual fans are on but if that's the case and they care a lot about social media engagement and what people are saying online the last thing they want is for every time United lose for people on the timeline to be calling for the Glazers out saying Edward was a Muppet calling Solskjaer a PE teacher they don't want that it, re it looks bad it, it, re um, it reflects badly on the club so just for that alone, I could see them saying, you know what, let's get, let's get someone in that's kind of like, as internationally liked in terms of a Pochettino. He's well liked uh, more so than a Solskjaer, I guess, especially Solskjaer, I guess, not liked mostly because of the protection he gets from these ex-pro teammates, you know, who kind of all want to, um, it doesn't really matter. But yeah, maybe that's the case. Who continues here? United have lost um, three of their six Premier League games already this term and have not lost uh, four of their first seven in a league campaign since 1989. We always got these weird records that our managers break over the years, isn't it? Some consistency there. The trip to Everton um, is United's last game for two weeks due to the November's internationals, a period that has become synonymous with top flight sackings. Solskjaer was asked whether he feared for his job after the 2-1. Uh, oops, pause that reversed in Istanbul and replied I declined to comment on such things of course it's early on and opinions are out there all the time you've got to stay strong I'm employed by the club to do a job and I do what's best for my ability and with my staff this doesn't you always sound like that's the thing you always see people like here like people like Stephen House and telling you don't listen to what the manager says you're just talking doesn't matter whatever happens on the pitch but he's so uninspiring when he does speak in it he sounds like such a bore like especially for somebody that was such a talented football player, such a cult hero at United and like a legit legend. It's such a shame for him to go out and it's like whimpering, right? You would have expected some level of fight just in terms of like, even if he would have just committed to just keep playing Daniel James, right? I would have respected that a lot more than just this chopping and changing. The diamond works, so I use it in two games because it worked in the other game. Then it doesn't work. Then I revert back to the system, dropping him, dropping it. Like, it's just like yeah uh, it's such a shame really considering how it started to where it's gone now man it really is it says yeah i hope i hope to go back oh what does it say here uh, pochettino declared his intention to return to manjuru during uh manjuru also during his appearance on monday night football he said i'm always ready to go again and to be involved in the game it's not uh stress when you are working it's not stress going into a training ground to prepare the match and to compete i hope to be back soon so we can start again to work i'm looking forward to being back in the game i love this game but it's difficult we are inside working on doing things that's the reality he's definitely wasn't back and he said that about 17 times so let's see man um i'm personally i think it's probably time for soul shock to go I just think he's at the end of the road here. He doesn't seem to have any answers coaching wise in order to kind of turn things around. Um, he obviously didn't get the players he wanted in the summer. That's obviously um, going to be a, some, an extenuating circumstance. But considering our club and considering how we are put together and managed uh, and run, it shouldn't be a surprise. And if you can't work under these constraints, unfortunately, just get someone else that can. If they can't, get someone else in. It just isn't an issue. There's nothing we can do about the ownership as fans. The only things that we can legitimately impact are, is the manager. The manager, the only thing that he can legitimately impact is that the thing that I'm sort of looking forward to is if Pochettino does get hired, that maybe because he's all of his clubs he's worked at prior, he's always had a footballing director, somebody he can kind of liaise with a kind of middle person um, to obviously the above, um, the people above in the boardroom, you basically sign the checks, somebody to advocate for him, somebody to kind of sound off ideas with, right, be as a, act as a soundboard. So I'm assuming if Pochettino does come in one of his, and he's a thorough guy, he seems like a guy that kind of, has his career path sort of like planned out right in a systematic type of way i especially with this time out he's basically been able to look at everything analyze it all i would hope that if he does get hired by united one of his requirements would be hey we have to get a dof director of football has to be hired i have to have somebody i can work with somebody that I can kind of you know that can have my back when we're going through a bad run of games that can you know be able to kind of you know share some ideas in terms of scouting types whatever it may be whatever they do i don't know what football directors do but he definitely would do that more so than maybe a social who i feel like wouldn't necessarily want a football director, I think. I don't know. I just get that feeling he'd want to kind of do on his own, kind of follow Cyrus Ferguson's footsteps. Um, you know, there's where I talk about Mike Feeling doing it, Michael Carrick doing it, maybe getting Fletcher involved, just like, ugh, yeah, yeah, man. 
But yeah, hopefully that this happens going forward. The, the sooner the better, really. So I can then go and move on and you know continue his career wherever it may be. Because I'm I'm still dubious he'll get another job in the Premier League. Personally, I think he's done such a sh- terrible job in terms of rep- especially considering that he's been a football manager for what ten years or so. He's been a coach. He's obviously won the league at Molder, but you know no one gives a shit about that really. So if, if ever there was a farmers league, that would be it. Of course, it's an achievement that he done it regardless. But still, let's not you know let's not get over excited here but to be in management for 10 years and to have people like Lampard and Arteta look you know you know well a lot more established and settled in their philosophy and what they want from players and their tactical sort of malleability and just their I don't know whatever it is they just look a lot more assured than um, Solskjaer does. That's a real kind of crying shame about this. So maybe this will be a chance for him to sort of rebound, start his career again, restart his career, sorry, at a smaller club, be able to kind of implement his ideas with a group of players who aren't necessarily such losers as our players are. And, you know, hopefully Pochino can come in and lead us to a new dawn. Who knows? Who knows? Okay, next on the list, what else do we have here? Oh, yeah, we have this funny video from the rag, right? Um, Supposedly, this is a video of some My Hermes driver deciding that he had enough whilst he's on the job. And he's just slinging, slinging the parcels in the back of the van, which, again, shouldn't be a surprise. If if ever you've dealt with My Hermes, which is a, um, sorry, Hermes, which is a delivery um, service here in the UK, nothing to do with the Birkin bags, unfortunately for you US members. I'm assuming they have Hermes in the US as well, personal service, right? Um, they work, you know, they're usually um, used by different companies. I think I'm sorry, some clothing stores use them, but for the most part, they're a ball like to use, um, high shipping prices, um, inconsistent delivery times, and your stuff always looks like it's been stepped on, right? Like legitimately somebody jumped on it like several times. And this explains it. This guy just flinging the parcels in the back of his van, um, heading on his way out to, to deliver some items. Look at that. Bang. Bang. And it's like, again, for the most part, he's probably going through some stuff, right? This isn't actions of somebody that's obviously happy with their job. But there's also a side of me that thinks, you know what? Maybe this is part of the fun when you're delivering, you know, your delivery driver. Just p- packing the stuff up is no fun at all, but slinging it in there like that is just, that's the vibe. Maybe, maybe, yeah, I don't know. Cause you'd have to go back pretty far in your van to collect the items when you, once you've kind of gone out on your delivery run. But Jesus Christ, he's literally flinging them over his shoulder and they're hitting the back of the lorry or the front of the lorry where the driving seat is. Insane. So if you ever wondered why your stuff comes up all smashed and shit, this is it. Most of the stuff that he's throwing in there looks like clothes, right? It looks like it's got, oh, this looks like an actual rectangle. Jesus Christ. So yeah, big up that man. And if you've ever been surprised as to why your boxes came up all scrunched, it's because the delivery drivers hate their bloody jobs. Talking about jobs, (laughs) nice segue there. Of course, most of you are aware um, lockdown 2.0 is now occurring in the UK as it's been as it's occurring in most places in Western Europe I think France Germany and a few other places have gone into another lockdown because the numbers are spiked because we're flipping idiots and we don't know what we're doing and we all kind of um, don't know how to what's that word called what's that term it's called um, delayed satisfaction it doesn't really exist um, on this side of in this side of, on this side of Europe right west side of Europe western side of Europe it doesn't really exist um we don't know how to like, you know, we don't know um, short term pain for long term gain it doesn't exist. So everyone's kind of been flouting the rules. Um, not in my area. I think people have been pretty um, compliant. People are, you know, wearing their face masks, keeping themselves distance, staying away from groups of people, blah, 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 blah. But in other places across London, across the UK, people are just, you know, flouting the rules and not giving a flying fuck. So lockdown 2.0 comes into place uh, on Thursday. And then I guess the night before all the Thursday action, people went out in droves to go and get one last drink in, um, which should have been, you know, we should have, the government should have known this already at least, but 
for some reason, they're always slow to react to these things. So here's a video from the BBC about some of the nonsense that went down with people in London and various parts of the UK, I guess, getting absolutely trolley. So it says here, people last night out before second lockdown. It says last night orders. At, let's do the video, see what it says. From the BBC, Jesus Christ. There's, a, there's basically a police van outside of a station, it looks like, right? Or a junction somewhere central London. And this is closing time in London. And I guess they're trying to coerce people to get out of the centre. There's people on the streets everywhere. Jesus Christ. The night before lockdown in England takes effect. It says on the screen, people piling onto the streets. 10pm curfew has been in place since the end of September, which has been an absolute shit show. Um, from the 5th of November, all the bars closed, isn't it, right? Um, pubs, bars and restaurants will close for four weeks. Jesus Christ. This is the following. Uh, people packed on the streets for one last night before England went into a second lockdown. They queued at pubs and ate out at restaurants before the doors closed at 10 p.m. Um, the streets of Soho and central London were heaving while emergency services in Merseyside were attacked with fireworks. <laughs> uh, bonfire. Imagine that. Imagine you're an emergency service worker, right? And you go to a fucking bonfire on a cold, wintry night when you could be at home with your kids and your family or, you know, cooped up in bed watching Netflix and the very same people you're kind of looking out for because they're, imagine grown up adults who like sitting outside and watching fireworks go up in the sky are a special breed of people anyway, right? Then you're going out there to protect these folk and then they decide to aim the fireworks at you. Like, that's just... The, those are the times where you question your existence and your vocation and it? it continues there it says the Met Police reported no restriction related incidences in London which is good to see people have the worst, best behaviour but look how this has probably been the only great thing about lockdown it's this amazing scenes that you see all over London right especially in the centre of London cars being kind of banned from certain days people being allowed to pile onto the streets tables everywhere it's so fucking cool it reminds me of like you know going to Paris and seeing everybody packed on the streets um get in the best spot at a restaurant to order some wine or have a cigarette and people watch like it's so bloody awesome I'm hoping that once things go back to normal, that this is a thing that they kind of continue. There's There are days in London where you can, where they sort of close the roads in the centre and people are allowed to kind of, you know, um, so it's basically to allow people to shop more, right? It's it's not kind of to, a, it's not like a mental health thing or uh, it's not like a uh, quality of life thing. It's more so for you to kind of uh, spend more money in their stores. So capitalism also always wins, but hopefully going forward it's such a positive thing for the shops and for the people that are, you know going to these events that they you know think of extending it somewhat because i like it i like it of course you've got the always the cookie people out there doing the most um queues outside of a pub imagine queuing to go into a pub this is the life we're living now once the jesus christ continue in brighton two people were arrested after a man suffered serious injuries in a fight involving 20 people people breakdancing and the victim remains in serious condition in royal sussex hospital standard large crowds also built up outside the pubs and cities like cambridge as people made the most of being out so yeah somebody outside in birmingham a kid breakdancing in a pair of cortez do your thing bro rude boy um, a cute people outside a Cambridge pub hoping to be served before 10 p.m. Jesus Christos. So I guess they, they want to be served and then head back out again. Fair enough. People enjoy their best night out until December in Bristol. Bristol's another great place for pubs, isn't it? And meanwhile, in the capital, many Londoners reported high levels of traffic as people attempt to leave the city before lockdown. Of course, isn't it? Standard. Mary Crea, chief executive of the walking charity Living Streets, tweeted about it that it was total traffic madness as she cycled home at 7 p.m. Tonight, everywhere, it's high traffic in the neighbourhood. And you've got pictures of people enjoying themselves. And of course the standard picture of a couple of girls heading off on a night out but the most important thing was last weekend right there was obviously some undercover um plague raves going on in the city of london i managed to get a few images of um i've, I've had i've got it unlisted on the old um, tube of you so don't ask for a link i'm not going to provide it but because you know i want to maintain these people's privacy and stuff but look at what's going down in london right when people are out and about right illegally because there shouldn't be look what's happening halloween weekend right look what's happening look at what is occurring my friends look at what is occurring absolute madness oh. 
and if you're not if you're if you're just listening to this it's a best place to stop this then it's, it's a group of revelers in what looks like an underground warehouse party somewhere in an undescript location dressed in very scantily clad clothes bunches of lace and fingerless gloves and whips and chains and you know your standard london um debauchery of a night during halloween which you know we weren't meant to go out anywhere you know there's no such thing as djs um nowadays in london so to see this is like such a throwback but also this is what's going on outside again absolutely loose there's a part of me that's super jealous though and, like, wild gift to be in a nightclub somewhere like this hearing this sort of stuff being played jesus christus It does look like thunder, doesn't it, right? Don't know where it is. Undescript location, private party, for only for a select few. Look at that. Absolute madness, isn't it? Look what's happening out here. And again, it's so freaky to see this sort of stuff. It's just because, you know, you don't... It's like when I look back at some of my archives of my images and stuff of places I've been in the past. And it's like, it's, it feels like a far away place, isn't it? Going out and partying and raving. So to see this, especially during these unprecedented times, it feels like an absolute throwback, mate. Absolute madness. Looks like fun though. Looks like absolute fun. Take me there. Hundred percent sober, right? <laughs> Look at that. Another location. It's like three parties in one video, right? Raves everywhere. Now we're in some sort of warehouse up apartment, it looks like, somebody's home. Controllers being used beyond the decks. Balloons everywhere. But look how nuts that looks during now, just imagine. This being your life, man. Just imagine the fun you'd be having. Some iconic London ravers out there having their express time. Of course, it's a bit of debauchery day. Skip that little bit. Anything else we got here? Let's speed it forward a bit. Whoops. Look, 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 look at that. Look how much of a throwback that is. Look at that. But yeah, man, that's what's occurring right now, isn't it, in London? Um, are these underground warehouse parties happening um, under the under the guise of what a private party or something i don't know what they are but regardless people are out there having fun in some way shape or form i guess be safe if you can i would prefer if you stayed in so we could all go out but hey you know people are gonna live their lives so it is what it is but these things are occurring on the underground under the surface away from prying eyes um, in one sense it's cool to see because i've only seen this because i follow certain people online and shit but i guess if you're not plugged in you will never know so it's good to know this it's not being broadcast that widely you sort of have to be in the know to find out considering how people are so obsessed with social it's quite nice that this is sort of like being done on the underground on the low without our knowledge in it don't you think i think so but anyway maybe that's just me moving on moving on what else do we have here what else do we have Mm -mm -mm. 
Okay, no, don't talk about that one. Let's move on to this. Yes, yeah, move on to this one. Actually, this, this might be a good one to talk about. So, you know, obviously, you know that um, Alex Jones had an appearance on the Joe Rogan podcast, a what, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a few days ago. Actually, it feels like a week, but it's not really a week. Um, it happened recently, and um, it was nice to see Alex Jones. Actually, not gonna lie, he's a he's a crazy old fool, right? Um, you know. The conspiracies that he's into can be a little bit far-fetched and you know somewhat problematic as i say on the internet but it's good to see him back on the internet because in my from my point of view i do think it was a bit over the top for him to be completely banned on all platforms i think most of these platforms are part of they form the part of our social communications um, they are the main publishing platforms that we all have to use without them you're essentially silencing people people can say oh you're not make your own youtube but the moment you make your own youtube you're going to need servers the people that back that use the servers are going to be influenced by the stuff that's happening with the other platforms and they're probably not going to have you on there look at what's happened with BitChute. so having them completely removed from the internet was obviously over the top i understand it from the point of this how sandy hook thing um, that was probably one of his biggest faux pas, considering the gravi you know, the gravitude of that tragedy um, involved kids, of course, and then going on to going on his broadcast. And uh, it's, again, I'm still not sure what he actually said regarding if or not he thinks they were actually crisis actors, the kids or the parents. But regardless, that just stuck on him in it and he can never shake that off so maybe that's the price you pay for the ultimate sin of you know alluding to the fact that maybe the children or the parents of the children that died aren't really their parents and you know whatever it may be you probably that's the price you need to pay for it but there is a part of me that thinks that maybe he should have had an extended period in hibernation away from everything and then be allowed to be brought back on the platforms and it's up to and then they still have processes in place on you know certain platforms where they could just not push you out right they could just not um allow the algorithm to kind of recommend you to people they could easily have done that and then it's up to the population the audience to decide whether or not they want to back him right um i think that's how it should be i think people should be silenced i think the audience or the public should decide with their feet with their ears with their streams who they want to listen to and if they want to listen to somebody that you don't like it is what it is you just turn it off and go to something else that you do like but regardless of that I do think it was interesting to see him on Joe Rogan's podcast because it did kind of awaken a side in Joe Rogan. You don't necessarily see too often, right? Even though I don't think Alex Jones is a staunch, rep a staunch Republican, he does maybe lean more to that side in terms of backing Trump and him being his friend and, you know, um, obviously trying to um, expose some of the um, dodgy dealings of the Democrats and the people on the left-hand side of politics in the US. But I did get the feeling that Joe was being a little bit more how would you say forward with his um re forward with his affinity with the republican party and it's always interested me why he doesn't just come out and say who he votes for he does sometimes he was versus independent or whatever it may be but just to kind of you know not get himself in any trouble and because he's got fucking money it literally doesn't matter who's in charge of the free world he just goes about living his life but especially now considering that we live in a climate where for the most part the left are the ones who are trying to counsel some of his friends in the comedy scene they're trying to get, diversify the lineups of comedy clubs at the expense of talent um they're ruining movies and whatever it may be for under the guise of racial diversity and social inclusion and all this sort of stuff you would think that he would probably lend himself more to republicans just because of those things and of course his hunting background fighting background um of course you know there's other stuff that he's obviously mostly left leaning on but he doesn't necessarily just come out and say it but of course alex jones is kind of joe rogan's mouthpiece and an official pr guy and he went on another podcast and essentially echoed the thoughts that most of us think that joe rogan is basically a closeted trump fan but he's not he doesn't want to come out and say it for whatever reasons it is so here's alex jones on another podcast that i jacked from the homeless cats who clipped this up so big up you whoever clipped it up but here's alex rogan sorry alex rogan alex jones talking about joe rogan's um, affinity for the republicans and we've got a bunch of people roger stone you name it and uh you know i was gonna be on joe rogan tonight i kind of invited myself on he said hey you can still come on if you want but it was already on just a week ago and it was becoming such a fiasco he is a and he's fire. gonna be on my show in a couple of weeks i'm gonna be back on with him soon and so there's not big issues he wants to sneak attack when i come on the show so that's why i'm not doing a show tonight yeah. that was my decision he said bow out if you want or come on 
off record, you know, soon. I said, I'd rather be back on by myself and let Tim Dillon and Joe and them do a great job. Yeah, so, look, all of us are Joe Rogan fans as well. Uh, we're all fans of well, Joe you know, Rogan. You know how it works. Yes. Yeah, you know we, how it works. When I announce it, he goes, why are you announcing it? Then they go after all the sponsors. When I just show up, they can't do that. Correct. Correct. I, and I will say this. Interesting, isn't it? So now we know that Joe is purposely flexing his muscles and sort of like, well, how do they call it? In the US and hip hop, um, he's letting his nuts hang, right? Uh, and this is what we've kind of always kind of secretly wanted as Joe Rogan fans, isn't it? Especially when, because especially off the back of, remember when he first went on Spotify and all the controversial podcasts didn't get populated over? He still hasn't explained it. There's still a sort of like a porting issue. But from what we know, the Spotify people didn't want those shows on his platform. It's cool. Fair enough. So now instead, he's going to have those controversial voices on his show and just not announce them prior, right? He's. I remember he kind of mentioned something along the lines of him getting annoyed that someone from Spotify reached out and asked him who's going to be on the show. He's like, I'm not telling you. I'm just, whoever's being good on is going to be on. And they don't have a schedule. They don't have any outline of who the guests are. So that obviously, um, you know, is a good indication as to the character of Joe. And again, like I said in the prior podcast, um, he's a great friend, man. He doesn't need to do this for Alex Jones. He doesn't need to do this for anybody that's been cancelled. He can just continue living his life. But the fact that he's willing to, I wouldn't say risk his platform because he's got more money than God. He can go go about and just start, restart a new podcast and be as um, you know rich and famous as he is now. But the fact that he's using his platform to provide his friends an option to get back into the public conversation, to get some eyes and ears on their projects again, because I'm assuming that would probably you know boost the numbers of the of what you call it. What's his net? What's his called? What's his site called? Infowars website again. It obviously boosts his profile. Maybe have people restart the conversation about you know um, cancellations on different platforms and stuff. I like it. I like that approach. Because uh, we share a similar audience with Joe Rogan. How entertaining was Alex Jones on Joe Rogan last week? I mean, that was the the best show he's done this year. That was the best. Alex is wham in it. Look how wide his shoulders are, mate. That's a big dude, isn't it? It's a big bloody dude. Best show of the year. Well, I better do a better job next time. I was a little. I, yeah. I, I got too drunk. I Correct. love Rick and Rose. I love Joe too. <laughs> yeah, he was he was he was on how fire. Was, how Joe's was been a closet Trump supporter for a while. Yeah. Has he really? But oh yeah, yeah. but it was Tim Pool finally got him to I mean he supports Trump now, so it's good. Really? Well you see him on air doing it. He said he kind of regretted saying that. He kind of let it out and then he was like when everyone reacted shocked, he was like, Oh shit, I think I said something I wasn't meant to say. Yeah. yeah, well, look, you always assume because you hear different issues and you're like, all right, well, he kind of favors the rights. But then he had Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard on when I was like, well, maybe he favors the look, left. Look, he likes everybody. He wants to get everybody tuned in. Joe's really a sweet. How weird is that in America? And again, I'll stop the clip from there. But how weird is it in America that you just can't speak to people, um, especially people involved in politics who are, you know, full on either side of the aisle? Because at the risk of being painted as somebody that agrees with their party politics or is you know somebody from the same political side how weird is that you just can't speak to people like you can't have a conversation with bernie because everyone immediately think you're on the left you can't just speak to ted cruz because people think you're on the right it's utterly bizarre and it just can't have conversations which maybe explains why that country is so divided at the moment it's such a hot button topic because i think about it myself like if if joe rogan was english and he voted tory would that change the way i listen to the podcast i don't think it would honestly don't Maybe that's because of music and because of my life growing up, listening to Morrissey, listening to the Smiths, well, first, you know, via skateboarding, and then, of course, progressing and listening to Morrissey's solo stuff and then getting older and finding out, you know, his some of his politics and worldviews are a bit abhorrent and a bit questionable. But it got me, it got me, it was good to go through that education and to go through that experience because it immediately got me in the... Um, in the way of thinking of separate how to separate art and artist and i did it with morrissey and the smiths and you know where no so i did it primarily with morrissey whoops i moved the camera there i did it primarily with morrissey and ever since my life has been much better for it i've been able to be a little bit desensitized from the stuff that people do in public and what they say and stuff and how that affects my um, level of enjoyment when it comes to listening to their work and stuff that they do I don't get that. It doesn't annoy me as much as other people would. But then I guess, I don't know, if you're balls deep in politics, I can understand why you might think, you know what? <sighs> this Joe Rogan guy was my dude, but the fact that he's supporting this guy that I'm, you know, 
I'd, I'd meant ardently against it just kind of tainted for me but honestly think if he was a Tory and if he was you know again if Jogan's from the UK it wouldn't bother me much I really want to care no doesn't doesn't really bother me whatsoever but i wonder what you guys think what do you think if if you if joe rogan came out and said hey especially post-election and said you know what um i was i was voting republican for the last four elections or i voted for trump in this last election i'm bummed he didn't win but i'm happy the country can move on and get mended like i wonder yeah well, what do you guys think let me know in the comments down below would it bother you if if joe was a republican and you're a democrat or whatever other party that's out there or do, you just, or do you honestly not care? Let me know what you think down below, especially from American listeners. Let me know in the comments. Okay, next one. Moving on here. <laughs> oh yeah, cool. We have this uh, funny clip. Cause, um, I know I mentioned previously I wouldn't talk about Callan and the whole issue. And I'm not, again, this is more so a funny topic that they kind of spoke about on their podcast. Um, what's it called? Conspiracy Social Club. Find it on Patreon. I think it's on patreon.com for slash Brian Callan. So make sure you support them on that one. This is a clip I got via the homeless cat. So big up those guys for clipping it. But um, it's funny because I guess <clears throat> some of these clips have been shared of the stuff they're doing behind the paywall on Patreon with um, Sam Tripoli and Brian Callen. I guess some people have been noticing that Tripoli's been acting a bit weird um, on camera because I guess they've noticed he's, you know, him looking geeked out, you know, which is a slang word for looking like he's high out of his mind, tripping balls on some uh, speedy type drugs, some booger sugar, as it may be affectionately known as. Um, but if you're familiar with Sam Tripoli and you're familiar with Tim for a hat and you're familiar with his various appearances on other podcasts, you'd know that's just how he is. He's got the similar sort of mannerisms as like a Eddie Bravo. And Eddie Bravo doesn't strike me as somebody that partakes in class A drugs. You just look like somebody that's always on, right? Like a who what did um what did Fia Von call Eddie Bravo affectionately? And Eddie Bravo had to put pressure on him and you know, basically made him apologize for it. Was it like a de a deaf Jack Russell or something, right? That's what he called him, and that's effectively what you could call um, Sam Tripoli. Sam Tripoli is like a deaf boxer, right? That's probably what he is in that regard. He's just so amped up and you know ready to go. And there's a maybe again, it's a it's a consequence of being into conspiracies. There's not a one conspiracy person that I've seen online, especially on YouTube. Maybe it's maybe it's part of the we have to do to be on a platform. You know, you have to be quite animated. Uh, maybe no, no. I guess if you're into conspiracies, the fact that you're into them makes you think that it's a person that's looking for answers, right? You're looking, you're looking to, um, you're questioning things around you. You're looking for answers. You dig a bit deeper. You end up in rabbit holes, and then your your mind's constantly being blown with all the connections you're making. Like, oh my god, ba 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 ba. You know, bro, look at this. This person's there. That person's there. They 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 that. So. That is naturally going to make you be on 10. You're always going to be amped up and ready to share whatever you've found out via some nefarious, you know, subreddit, forum, group chat, whatever, right? You're just going to eager to share it. So maybe that's why they can come across a little bit, you know, high off the old um, Pablo Escobar, which I don't think is true, personally. I don't think so. I don't, again, I, don't, I just don't think, I think having been around people who partake in those kind of things on a regular basis um you know when they're on it all the time you know right um i think especially with somebody like a sam Tripoli to be running the stuff to be you know he, he does so many podcasts he's always recording and putting out content um you know he's got two young chill kids i think i think he's got triplets isn't it i'm pretty sure right it's pretty difficult to balance a home life being a desk being a present dad especially during lockdown, putting out the content he's putting out and to be completely high all the time. Now, again, I know it can be possible, but from what I see, I just think it's somebody that's really enthusiastic about what he does and kind of wants to share it with everybody. But anyway, let's play the clip of Sam Tripoli addressing some of the rumours out there on the interwebs about him and basically telling us that under no circumstance... Hey, we're in. Hey, I'll let's play it. <laughs> <laughs> We're in. Hey, I want to address something to the comment <laughs> section real quick about some of you motherfuckers think I'm out here tweaking my balls off during these <laughs> shows, man. I take vitamins, but here's what I'll do. Any vitamin coke. Now, I'm only pausing it now, and I'm gonna let it run out. It Again, I pause it at one of the worst moments, right? Brian Cannon looking very devious, like, uh-oh. And then uh, Tripoli looking, you know, very, uh, 
happy, let's say. Question, why is it in most forms of entertainment industry, or most forms in most versions of the entertainment industry, most scenes, most places, most sectors, whatever, why is it in the entertainment industry there's such a taboo around people saying openly and admitting that they partake in such, you know, things when everyone is necessarily essentially doing it? Why is that the case, you think? People are quick to claim and to wear like a badge on their chest or to essentially form their entire personality around it like Bert Kreischer when it comes to drinking or smoking weed like what's that name what's this guy it's getting high with Doug all these people right like you, that's okay but somehow whenever it goes to like the class A stuff even mushrooms have been kind of you know that's a fine I've heard people talk about that acid but when it comes to stuff like coke and stuff like or even just heroin like People are using these things on a daily basis. I'm pretty sure no one's naive enough to think that it's just, um, you know, uh, malnutrition crackheads on the side of the streets that are doing these things. You know, people that you look up to, people that you watch their content every day are doing these things on a regular basis. So for people to assume or for him to get super defensive about it is weird, especially being a stand-up comedian, because I'm sure that back room of those comedy clubs, some of those toilets, you know, you put a UV light on that shit. And it's flipping, glowing. You know what I mean? I'm pretty sure. And we're under no illusions these things happen. So why the hesitancy to ad not admit it? Because, you know, you don't want to get yourself in trouble. But you know this is happening. You know this is a thing. Like, it's not an odd... It's not like a out-of-the-blue question to kind of ask somebody, right? It doesn't really... Um, I don't know. I just... I'm not too sure about the reaction. But anyway, let's play the clip. Me, you motherfuckers want to talk some shit? Put a G down in a bat? I'll piss anytime you want. I Put a thousand dollars in. He's not doing any drugs. A lot of blow, but no drugs. No blow. <laughs> no nothing. That shit's gone. I take vitamins, I and I just found this group of vitamins that makes me feel vitamins. tweaky, and I enjoy it. And I just take. I'll what show you the they? vitamins. Because you, you, I, you're, you don't seem any different than you're all. You always are like. This. Yeah, but these people, they're like. I don't know. For some reason, every clip you have, I just kind of look at you like. <laughs> when I went, we went right, we in Afghanistan for eleven days, and we weren't we weren't sleeping, and you were still like this. <laughs> still yeah, I'm, I'm high energy, sloppy dog. Okay, tweaking, tweaking. Like who shows up to a thing tweaking? Wait, go back to the heavy gals. So they they decide. But one thing's for sure, that's the clip, and you were ready at the end of it. But one thing's for sure, Sam Tripoli is a hell of a friend. He's a really good friend of all the flipping Hollywood friends Callan has, and all the podcasters, and all these industry celebs who were, you know, quick to jump on his show when he was a Brendan on firing a kid and talking about how funny he was and all this malarkey and kissing his ass. The moment he gets involved in a scandal, again, it's admittedly it's a serious scandal. He's got some serious accusations against him. But the only guy to really stand by him, really, of course, is Shaw. Right? He's still sending him some money through the TFAK accounts and making sure he's okay on that side and still talking about him in a good way. But, you know, Sam Tripoli, man. Like, again, I love Joe Rogan, but he's never mentioned Callan's name or Crystalia's name since the uh, public cancellation. So, again, if Sam Tripoli's on whatever he's on and he's holding Callan down and supporting him behind the scenes and putting his basically reputation on the line by aligning himself with Brian, then I'm all for it, man. I think that, that, goes, that says a lot more about his character as a person than the fact that he likes to partake in some drugs because he's an adult like leave the guy alone if he's on if he's on what he's on it is what it is i think it's a probably a bit of a bullshit excuse i think you know to saying people you're on vitamin when people accuse you for looking like you're tripping out of your head and then you say you're on vitamins i don't know man it sounds a bit fishy to me but again do what you want you live a free life you play your taxes you look after your kids and your family you have a successful career and even if you didn't Whose business is it? Honestly, lockdowns basically taught me that um, we're all kind of going through whatever we're going through during these unprecedented times. Um, you know, joy and enjoyment are sort of short, right? In short supply, there's not much to really get excited about in the mornings. If you're just under the, especially if you're on furlough, like imagine you're being paid to stay at home. Every day is the same, right? It's just boring. So if, if you had need to partake in some extracurriculars, you know, to kind of keep your mood stable or to kind of just give you a reason to get up in the morning so be it man so be it do what you can because no one else is gonna save you that's for damn sure anyway that is the agassi no zinger show episode number two no 396 sorry thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company and your ears as per usual if it's your first time listening to a show if you're the 
YouTube channel, make sure you smash that subscribe and like button down below and leave me a comment. And of course, share it. If you listen via the podcast app, please leave me a five star review and share that show with your friends. And as ever, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Until then, take care, be safe, peace, my friends.